arise, Sir Edmund. <sighs> Does he know what Aslan did for him? No, of course not. Oughtn't he be told? Oh, surely not. It would be too awful for him. Think how you'd feel if you were he. All the same, I think he ought to know. Will the two of you be quiet? It's not every day your brother is knighted, you know. A few days later, in the great hall of Caer Paravel, that wonderful hall with the carved roof and the west wall hung with peacock's feathers and the eastern door which looks towards the sea, in the presence of all their friends and to the sound of trumpets, Aslan solemnly crowned them and led them to the four thrones. Once a king or queen in Narnia, always a king or queen. Bear it well, sons of Adam. Bear it well, daughters of Eve. So the children sat on their thrones, and scepters were put into their hands, and they gave rewards and honors to all their friends, to Tumnus the Fawn, to the Beavers and Giant Rumblebuffin, to the Leopards and the Good Centaurs and the Good Dwarfs, and to the Lion. And that night there was a great feast in Caer Paravel, and revelry and dancing and gold flashed and wine flowed. I say, where's Aslan? Has anyone seen him? Not for ages. Do you think he's gone? He looks as if he has. Well, he comes and he goes. One day you'll see him, another you won't. He doesn't like being tied down. Of course he has other countries to attend to. It's quite all right. He'll often drop by, only you mustn't press him. He's wild, you know. Not like a... like a tame lion. And now, as you see, this story is nearly at an end. These two kings and queens governed Narnia well and long and happy was their reign. They sought out and destroyed the remnants of the White Witch's army. They made good laws and kept the peace. They drove back the fierce giants, quite a different sort from giant Rumblebuffin, when they ventured across the northern frontier. They entered into friendship and alliance with countries beyond the sea. And they themselves grew and changed as the years passed over them. Peter became a tall and deep-chested man and a great warrior, and he was called King Peter the Magnificent. Susan grew into a tall and gracious woman with black hair that fell almost to her feet, and ambassadors of kings from beyond the sea came to ask for her hand in marriage. She was called Susan the Gentle. Edmund was a graver and quieter man than Peter and great in counsel and judgment. He was called King Edmund the Just. And Lucy was always happy and golden-haired, and all princes in those parts desired her to be their queen, and her own people called her Queen Lucy the Valiant. So they lived in great joy, and if ever they remembered their life in this world, it was only as one remembers a dream. Oh, whoa! <laughs> Is this where the beast has gone? Aye. Fair consorts, let us now alight from our horses and follow this white stag into the thicket. For in all my days I never hunted a nobler quarry. <laughs> Noble or a rascal, thou wouldst like to have the three wishes when thou hast caught him. I've no doubt. <laughs> it is so. <laughs> uh, oh. Oh. Fair friends. Here is a great marvel, for I seem to see a tree of iron. Madam, if you look well upon it, you shall see it is a pillar of iron with a lantern set on the top thereof. Oh, by the lion's mane, a strange device. 
To set a lantern here where the trees cluster so thick about it and so high above it that if it were lit it should give light to no man. <laughs> Sir, by likelihood, when this post and this lamp were set here, there were smaller trees in the place, or fewer, or none. For this is a young wood, and the iron post is old. I know not how it is, but this lamp on the post worketh upon me strangely. It runs in my mind that I have seen the like before, as it were, in a dream, or in the dream of a dream. Mm. Yes, sir, it is even so with us also, and more. For it will not go out of my mind that if we pass this post and lantern, either we shall find strange adventures, or else some great change of our fortunes. Madam, the like foreboding stirreth in my heart also. And in mine, fair brother. And in mine too. Wherefore, by my counsel, we shall lightly return to our horses and follow this white stag no further. Madam, therein I pray thee to have me excused. For never since we four were kings and queens in Narnia have we set our hands to any high matter as battles, quests, feats of arms, acts of justice and the like, and then given over. But always what we have taken in hand, the same we have achieved. Sister, my royal brother speaks rightly. And it seems to me we should be shamed if for any fearing or foreboding we turned back from following so noble a beast as now we have in chase. And so say I. And I have such desire to find the signification of this thing that I would not by my good will turn back for the richest jewel in all Narnia and all the islands. Then in the name of Aslan, if ye will all have it so, let us go on and take the adventure that shall fall to us. Allow me to lead on. <laughs>